session. Today we are having a topic on management of the symptom complex of agitation and breathlessness in context of COVID-19. It will be taken by Dr. Sunitha. So we can start with Ma'am's presentation. We can have a discussion round following up. Okay. Thank you all for joining in. Over to Sunil sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so today we are going to discuss about a symptom complex, breathlessness and agitation, which um, usually occurs together in COVID-19. And we know that a breathlessness is one of the um, one of the very uh, everybody will be in fear when they have a breathlessness. So uh, agitation is another symptom which we often difficult uh, find too difficult to control. So the session will be handled by Dr. Sunita Daniel, uh, who has done her MCP in general medicine and MCP in palliative medicine. Uh, and she has uh, worked uh, abroad as well as uh, in India, and uh, right now she is working as the specialist medical officer in palliative medicine at the Jana Hospital, Amarna. And uh, welcome, Sanita, and it's over to you. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you, Rajashmi. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. And thanks to uh, Thailand India for giving me one more uh, session. Um, so welcome to you all um, to this uh, season four of Thailand COVID Echo uh, and the uh, class two, where I'll be dealing with management of um, symptom complex of breathlessness and agitation in the context of uh, COVID-19. Uh, the education material for this uh, Thailand COVID Echo has been jointly prepared by Thailand India and Thailand COVID Kerala group. The learning objectives of this session uh, is uh, what we're trying to find out is uh, whether we'll be able to assess and rate the severity of breathlessness in COVID-19 patients. Um, also to try and identify agitation with, uh, with and without delirium and uh, learn something about how to manage both symptoms. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this education material is actually presented as an e-book and uh, all the symptoms uh, we have done in the ebook is in the is in the form of algorithms. So I'll be mentioning all these algorithms to draw the session. I've given a link in the chat um, to download the ebook. So those who haven't downloaded can do it now, um, so that the, uh, you will be familiar with the algorithms. Um, and uh, we'll be discussing what's in the ebook as well as the uh, other effective management techniques. Uh, the other useful um, uh, education material for palliative care is the PalliCare app which again can be downloaded as an app to your smartphone and which uh, supports with the symptom management um, in the palliative care in general settings. So how do, how do patients uh, present with COVID-19? Now, I'm not sure whether uh, in, in your case, whether you've already seen some patients with COVID-19 or not, or you must have at least read about all the case reports of all the uh, patients that are, you know, that are presenting in various parts of the world. So there are, um, most of them actually present in the least serious or the subclinical form uh, where the patient has a virus, but it doesn't present with any symptoms. And the other group is the upper respiratory tract infection one, where they present with fever, cough, with milder symptoms, uh, like headache and conjunctivitis. Uh, and again, they are able to transmit the virus. The third group are the uh, flu-like symptoms one, and uh, usually, again, the patients uh, will keep off the work, so they'll have all symptoms of flu, and uh, they could present themselves to the hospital. And the final one is a severe illness one, where they definitely have to come to the hospital. Um, you know, they can't manage at home. They'll have all the features of severe illness, and uh, it can present as, as a pneumonia, so as a COVID pneumonia, as we say. And these patients have a symptom complex of breathlessness and agitation. And our talk for the next half an hour is to deal with a patient like that. How do we deal with the patient with a symptom complex of breathlessness and agitation? Now, what we see, uh, what we are uh, read from case reports is that the clinical profile of the patients who raise this stage, so the COVID-19 pneumonia, when they reach end of life or end of life uh, care scenario, they usually have uh, some features of uh, usually with high breathlessness or it's described as air hunger, where the patient is uh, noted to be actually um, you know, very, very ill because they are breathless and struggling to breathe. There'll be evidence of high distress. Uh, there can be high delirium and agitation and high fever. And, and the sad thing is that uh, it all happens so quickly. So you could end up with having this phase and then 
ended up dying within a, a couple of hours, a couple of days. So there's a cessation of life which occurs over a short number of hours or days. And that's a typical scenario when they present with a severe illness. Now, just a brief description about the pathophysiology of COVID. So in this graph, uh, if it describes the three stages. So uh, they've divided into, sta into three stages. We've got stage one, stage two, and stage three. The first stage of the stage one, which is the early infection, they've got mild clinical symptoms and signs. So as I mentioned before, the symptoms can be fever, dry cough, headache, diarrhea, and the signs uh, which include, or the investigations, uh, which can indicate maybe lymphopenia, increased prothrombin time or increased D dimer and LDH. And some patients will just present like that and they get better and they, they might not even have to come to hospital. But few patients can go on to the next stage, or the stage two, which is described as a pulmonary stage. Again, divided by 2A and 2B. And the patients will present with dyspnea and hypoxia. And there can be um, signs and investigations with uh, abnormal radiology, elevated transaminases and low normal procalcitonin. And then few patients unfortunately move on to the stage three, third stage, which is described as a hyperinflation stage, where they can present with the typical ARDS feature. So there's acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, or systemic inflammatory response syndrome. They can have cardiac failure and uh, the lab investigations will show raised inflammatory markers, elevated troponin and pro-BNP. Pro so what they've described is that the, the stage two and stage three are together called as the post-inflammatory response stage. And uh, obviously a, a, under the graph, you can see potential therapies that has been mentioned uh, for all the stages. And most of them, again, we know are experimental therapies. Uh, and uh, I think for the latest evidence is for remdesivir for US has said that they've, they've brought some evidence for it uh, working in, in COVID. So all the others, again, different regions of the world will try different therapies and different guidelines for that. But it's important for our session for us to remember is that the, the last stage of the stage three, the cytokine storm, towards the second and the third stage will cause the hyperinflation phase and also can present with severe breathlessness, agitation, complex. So what is different in uh, palliative care in patients with COVID-19? And again, I, I don't know the background of, of you, how much of you have got palliative care experience or have seen patients with palliative care or, or have worked with palliative care physicians. But um, according to a blog published in the British Medical Journal, uh, opinion, uh, uh, it was published from doctors who are looking after patients in a small town in Italy. And what they've said is that they've redefined palliative care. Uh, they, re they redefine the role of palliative care in the COVID situation as an ultra emergency situation where we can see there's no relationship between the patient and the family. So the, the healthcare worker, the patient, the family, there is no relationship between them because the situation says that we can't maintain a, a continuous relationship with them. There's no typical palliation timing for sharing and planning the treatment path. Uh, and as I mentioned, because deaths are very, very quick and deaths are linked to the traumatic psychological experience which is traumatic for both the family and the members of the treating team. And situation changes so rapidly that the typical palliative care physician doesn't get the time or the chance to have a direct face-to-face -face conversation with patients or the family. So uh, it's, it's so difficult for us because for us, uh, you know, the most important thing is the communication that we do with the patients and the family, the touch, uh, the smile that we're able to provide or the comfort that we provide. And because of all the, all the, uh, the problems with the, uh, the PPE and everything, which will be described again in the communication um, session that you'll have, we find it very, very difficult to deal with such patients and families in this scenario. Now coming to the uh, first part of today's session, so breathlessness. Now at this moment, I would like, like to pause and would like to encourage you to think about the last breathless patient that you have seen. Now, as I said, it could be the COVID patient if you've already been managing them, or it could be any other breathlessness patient, a patient present with breathless. To me personally, this is a more difficult symptom to manage than, than even pain, because breathlessness, um, what that feels to a face, it's a subjective symptom, and um, it's, it's, more, it's more than just a vital sign to all human beings. And we can, we can describe breathlessness as a vital sign that is intensely connected to the patient or oneself. And uh, we've always heard about you know, describing the start of the life and end of life. We can describe starting of life as taking the first breath and ending of life as the last breath. So why, breathlessness is very much connected to one's own self. And uh, sometimes patients are known to describe the symptom as, 
I've been breathing all my life, but now I've started experiencing it. So it, it is something that we do, all of us do day in and day out every day. But once, when does it become a symptom? When does it become um, something that affects your quality of life? That is the point when we have to interfere. And that's what happens in all these patients. And unfortunately, it happens so quickly that the conventional uh, methods of managing probably might not work for them. And we need to find and devise uh, in a strategies to actually uh, manage the situation. So again, coming back to what is different in COVID-19 and breathlessness. So the, I, I mentioned the complex pathophysiology, a bit of the complex pathophysiology, but how the patient reaches that stage. So there's a cytokine storm is there, there's a hyperinflammatory hyper stage is there, and also the various explanation about the, what exactly happens in the lungs. So it can be a pneumonia consolidation, there are this description about alveolar damage, uh, this description for pleural effusion, um, again, uh, theories about new microtombe formation. So we don't know. It keeps changing every day. The complex pathophysiology keeps on changing every day. And that's one of the most important things uh, to know, know that that's why the symptom is so difficult to manage. And then on top of that, the second thing is about the vulnerability. We know that everywhere, even in newspapers, will tell, tell us that if you're old, you might actually die of COVID-19. If you've got co comorbidities, you might die of COVID-19. So that's, that's the vulnerability of, of the disease. Everybody knows, or the patients themselves know that as age advances or with comorbidities, the trajectory becomes worse. The third one is the anxiety associated with the disease. This is unlike any other pneumonia. There's lots of anxiety associated. And I, I think it's unlike other pandemics also, which, which probably we have seen in our lifetime, like the SARS and all. Even this, much before um, it became so, it was declared as a pandemic. There was lots of reports. You can, you can daily news, a uh, lot of information from the media, the social media, newspaper. So there's information loading going on, which will add to the anxiety of the patient. And... And on top of that, there's no specific treatment for COVID-19. And, uh, and because of the isolation that is needed, the anxiety of the patient will be worsened in the isolation wards. Um, and furthermore, you know, if the patients, uh, there's a stigma attached to it. So the patient becomes positive. They've got this guilt of becoming positive, the guilt of infecting their uh, family members, the gift of infecting their elderly pa parents, their children, the fear of doing that and the loss of income attached, which actually might start before getting infected because everybody would be in lockdown and you already already got a loss of income. And then once you become infected, that is again, all the more worse. So all this uh, can uh, work together and worsen the symptom. So as I said, breathlessness, it's, it's a complex symptom. And when anxiety is worsened, the symptom of breathlessness is worsened. So we can't just look at the breathlessness symptoms just from the cardiac or pulmonary point of view, but we have to connect uh, to all the other features also, all the other um, features of the disease also. Now, how do we manage? So coming to the management, uh, again, this is given in the ebook. And uh, just to mention, all the guidelines that we've written in the ebook, uh, uh, the symptom management has been taken from the uh, NICE guidelines and adapted um, to our settings. We've also used the Association of Palliative Medicine guidelines, the APM guidelines, and also there's a recent publication from the European Respiratory Journals. Now, all the guidelines, when we start with the guidelines, we always assume that the patient is receiving all the appropriate supportive treatments and all the correctable causes have been considered and managed. So you have to follow the COVID-19 management protocol on the site uh, and all the correctable courses. You can see antibiotic treatment for any supratic infection has been taken care of. Um, that can actually improve the fever and the cough and breathlessness and delirium. Um, optimize the comorbidity. So patient will be having a maybe COPD exacerbation to manage that, heart failure, diuretics to manage that. All these should be corrected before we go on to the um, management of symptoms as such. Uh, treat the bronchospasm. And then we come to a point when uh, it is described as refractory breathlessness. And that's a term that we have used in our ebook, uh, in our algorithm. It's a breathlessness that we have described uh, as defined as not improving despite optimal medical management. So we start with the first medical management and we try and manage symptoms, but the patient still becomes symptomatic or the breathlessness doesn't improve with the optimal medical management, which we, tame, which we label as refractory breathlessness. Now, how do you manage a patient? So when we manage a patient, in, in our algorithm, we have divided into pharmacological and non-pharmacological management. We've also divided the algorithm as patient management ward and patient ICU. And there's some subtle differences between the two, which we'll, you'll understand as I proceed to the session. Now, remember that uh, COVID-19, it's, it's a different scenario, but still the management and the goals of care should, be, should not be different 
with any other medical medical condition. Now you will have further discussion about goals of care and triage uh, discussion further session. But always remember all the comorbidities and the patient's preferences and values are also more important. So the, the reason I'm mentioning this is uh, because the management board and ICU, the criteria for managing them in board and ICU will depend on the triage situation. So uh, always consider that uh, before you start the management and always uh, try and have discussions with the follow-up teams after consultations uh, to understand the dis uh, distress of the, of the consulting teams to do that. Um, and coming on to the non-pharmacological management, you could try different positions. So this is, a, this, is a, this is one place where I've told that your management might not be adequate or appropriate as a known COVID condition because situations can change pretty quickly. So if any other business scenario, we can actually teach them a lot of non-pharmacological techniques. Um, so either us or the respiratory physiotherapist can teach them uh, relaxation techniques or breathing techniques. In this scenario, we might not have the time to do that, but you know, we could still try if they are, if they are well enough for that. Um, techniques can be taught to the patients, um, which, which, which include uh, relaxation training, breathing techniques. And one of the important breathing techniques that, uh, that we usually tell the patient is first lip breathing which we're all familiar with and it's described as um, have you smell a flower or blow a candle so the expiration should take twice the time of inspiration so you smell a flower and blow a candle so the your your, your phase of expiration must be twice the time of uh, inspiration but there are lots of other techniques that you can actually or a respiratory physiotherapist can train the patient to do that when they're well enough which can be used when they become unwell if they learn then a proper positioning of the patient. Um, so this, this can be uh, to give uh, any position that give maximum comfort to the patient. So which can be either sitting upright or legs uncrossed or let the shoulders droop or keeping the head up or leaning forward. All these positions are known to improve the uh, ventilation or improve the um, uh, reckless uh, symptoms. Um, there's also uh, now, now you know, the, the patients are being nursed or nursed in a prone position, not just being ventilated, but they are spending periods of time nursing in, a, in the prone position, which actually improves the lung recruitability and prevent them from going into mechanical ventilation. So that is something that we can try. Oxygen inhalation and then cooling of the face using cold flanners. Now, um, the, the use of fans in breathlessness has been, again, an evidence-based approach, has been tried in palliative care settings lots of times. But in the COVID scenario, we don't advise the use of fans for breathlessness, a handheld fan for breathlessness, as there's an increased risk of spread of in infection. So we use a cold flannels or cold towels to cool the face. And this can be tried both in the ward and ICU, depending on the scenario. Now coming to the pharmacological management. The mainstay of treatment uh, of breathlessness uh, for symptom management is morphine or opioids. Um, and morphine is the gold standard for that. Now, the doses that we are suggesting is we have to divide that into ward and ICU. So in this slide, I'm talking about the ward management, where you can start with uh, short-acting morphine. So doses are for short-acting morphine. So it can be oral morphine, 2.5 to 5 milligram per orderly every four hours. Or if you're going into subcut dose, you can use one to two milligram morphine. Now, as I mentioned uh, in the pathophysiology, the breath lenses would be as, can be associated with anxiety. So if there's evidence of anxiety, evidence of panic attack, we can start some benzodiazepine. Again, low dose benzodiazepine, we can start midazolam, which is like very short acting. So you can start two to five milligram to uh, Q4 thoroughly, you can give an IV or subcut, or you can, if you can give uh, orderly, lorazepam can be given, which can be given sublingual. Uh, 0.5 to 1 milligram sublingual SOS acid for anxiety and agitation. Now, if the symptoms doesn't settle, we can start a continuous infusion. Or if there's, there is a facility to start continuous infusion, um, like a syringe pump or a drip set is available, we can start a continuous infusion with morphine 10 milligram and medicine 10 milligram over 24 hours. And the reason that we advise continuous infusion is that because all these medications, when given in bolus, are quite short acting. And in the scenario where you know, we try to minimize the contact with, of the healthcare worker with the patient, um, so every time going every two hours or three hours to give a bolus dose might not be the best interest of the healthcare worker. And also to have a better symptom control, we advise giving a continuous infusion. But all the, all the scenarios and all the settings might not have the facility to use a continuous infusion. And that's why we are given, given an option of going for the bolus doses also. Now, 
the morphine dosage, uh, again, if, this, if the patient is elderly or if the patient has got evidence of renal failure, we can, uh, we can start at much lower dose. Morphine can be given either at a lower dose or it can increase the duration to either 6 hourly or 8 hourly uh, can be given. Now, uh, a few words about morphine. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the use of morphine in breathlessness, but unlike uh, as we've studied in the medical school days, things have changed. The fear of morphine is actually, uh, you know, it's less among the medical professionals now. And we've got sufficient evidence to say that morphine can be used to manage breathlessness. Um, now, the theories that is formulated is one, um, or the evidence is based on, uh, morphine will reduce a hyperventilatory response to hypercapnia. So because of that, the respiratory rate would come down when you give morphine, but it doesn't go down to respiratory failure as such, but the respiratory uh, rate comes down and the patient has got a better sensation of breathing and the, the work of breathing will also come down. The other explanation is it can produce pulmonary vasodilatation, which results in a be better ventilation perfusion ratio. Um, and as we all know, morphine can be used for myocardial infarction, chest pain or myocardial infarction. It can be used in pulmonary edema along with diuretics. Uh, morphine has got a vas vasodilatory action, dilatory action, which will reduce the cardiac output. And the other one is because morphine actually causes sedation of the cortical centers. And the, uh, depending on that, because of that, because breathlessness, as, as I described, the feeling, the feeling of breathlessness is reduced. And this was proved in a randomized uh, crossover clinical trial where a single dose administration of immediate release morphine, oral morphine, uh, in chronic respiratory COPD patients and advanced in chronic breathlessness syndrome patients, there was a statistically significant reduction in the exertional breathlessness and exercise tolerance in these in endurance in these adults. And uh, what they found was that the awareness of the, uh, was because of the redu reduction in the neural respiratory drive. And all the centers where the, um, uh, the various cortical and the subcortical centers which are implicated in the neurophysiology breathlessness actually has got opioid receptors. So that's why these opioid receptors, uh, opioid acts on them and decrease in the respiratory drive and which actually helps them with the feeling of breathlessness. So there's, there's, there's enough evidence now to know that morphine can be used for symptomatic management of chronic breathlessness syndrome and COPD patient. And that's the reason we have tried or we've suggested the use of morphine for COVID-19 patients also. And in addition, we also know that morphine could, uh, has actually got the analgesic effect of morphine. So any pain, you know, any, any sort of respiratory pain, any chest pain, any myalgia associated with the, with the illness can also be managed with morphine. And that also help, help with the breathlessness. Continuing on to management uh, in the ICU. So as I mentioned, there's a slight difference uh, in the algorithm when we've mentioned the management of ICU. Non-pharmacological remains the same. The morphine doses, um, again, we've gone more for parental administration of drugs in the ICU setting, um, mainly because the staff will be better used to that and also for the ease of administration. And we've also used, suggested the use of fentanyl also in ICU setting. Again, you know, it varies with, the, with, the, with different places. Some people are more, um, you know, okay to use fentanyl in ICU settings than the ward. So we have suggested morphine and fentanyl for ICU. Uh, the dose of morphine is the same, but we have uh, changed the frequency to Q2 hourly. And fentanyl, you can give 25 microgram IBS subcut Q2 hourly. Midaslam, the same dose, 2.5 milligram Q4 hourly. And the raspam, again, 0 0.5 to 5, 5 uh, in milligram sub, sublingually as service. Now, uh, sometimes the patients in the ICU might be too weak to take oral medication. And that's one of the reasons we would go for uh, IV medication. But to remember that if the patient has got a CKD, chronic renal failure, or EGFR is less than 30, as I mentioned, you can use morphine at a lower dose of increased uh, frequency, but fentanyl is a better option. So again, if a patient is not in the ICU in board and have to, they've got end-stage renal disease, it's safer to use fentanyl as compared to morphine. Um, and if, if uh, and I'm sure in, in ICU, there will be an option of giving continuous infusion. So dosage we have suggested is morphine of 15 milligram of fentanyl 100 microgram and uh, midazolam 10 to 30 milligram can be given IV, IV or subcut over 24 hours. Now significant breathlessness uh, towards end of life. Now this is where the patient comes, as I mentioned, comes towards the high dyspnea, the high breathlessness, the air hunger stage, when the respiratory rate goes more than 30 per minute and they're clearly dying. So all the reversible factors are changed and they're clearly dying. It's always advisable. We've given a, higher, a slightly higher dose of morphine in this scenario, 2.5 milligram IV to 5 milligrams of good. 
um, and 25 microgram of uh, you know uh, fentanyl IV of 50 microgram subcut. Uh, again, medicalum. These doses can be given every 15 to 30 minutes till there's improvement of symptoms. Or you could give a five dose, a five milligram stat dose and start an infusion. Or continuous infusion with morphine, 30 milligram and fentanyl, 50 to 150 to 300 microgram can be started along with medicalum. Now, all the dosages and the maximum dosages that we are suggested is only a suggestion, which depends on the patient's symptoms. Some patients will settle with just a bolus doses. Some patients will settle with less doses of morphine or fentanyl in the driver. Again, with medicalum also, we start with 5 milligram, 10 milligram, gradually increase at 15 to 60 milligram. The only problem with that is, as I mentioned, our time is short. So we might not have the luxury of reviewing the patient after 24 hours and you know, managing symptoms because we probably just have one chance to get it right. So that's the reason we've given a higher doses. Again, always go with, the, with your uh, patient to manage according to your patient. Now, this is the algorithm. It's given in page 14 of the current version of the ebook. We are in the process of doing the second uh, revision of the ebook, so it might change, but currently this is given page 14, and everything that I've covered in the slides are given in the algorithm. Uh, everything is there. It's just given as, a, as, a, as an algorithm which you can print out and use in the words if needed, and that's why it's presented like that. So to, to summarize, morphine is a useful drug um, in relieving symptoms. You can use a cough, breathlessness, providing added symptom relief in quality of life. Uh, the administered morphine will not produce respiratory depression. Uh, morphine can be administered by multiple doses. It can be PO, IV, subcut or PR. And consideration with a palliative care specialist can be complemented on ensuring symptom relief. So you've mentioned in the in the algorithm, at which point you should call a specialist in person. So you could call an ICU consultant or a palliative care specialist if, the, if you are struggling to manage the symptoms with the doses suggested in the algorithm. Moving on to the second part of the topic, which is delirium and agitation. Again, uh, picture in your mind, the last uh, agitated patient that you have seen, uh, it, this picture is actually of delirium tremens or, or alcohol withdrawal. It can be any cause. If the patient is difficult to control. You've got three or four people standing next to the patient too. Uh, to manage them, and how do you? And this this scenario can typically occur in in a in a COVID scenario also. So, a COVID nineteen patient um, who was 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 at home has was having mild fever, but has come to the hospital. Uh, you know, was get, is getting getting examined by the healthcare workers, and um, once he uh, comes to the hospital, he tests positive, and then he's examined by the healthcare workers in a busy admission area. And obviously the patient would be quarantined uh, at home and in hospital, so mild anxiety will be there. And uh, which is again, uh, there'll be further contributing factors to the anxiety, so the patient is away from the family. Uh, they're worried about what's in store for them. If it's positive, then how are they going to change? How the, how the disease is going to change? And there'll be associated uh, dyspnea. Now, the condition, as the patient gets admitted, the condition can worsen, the dyspnea worsens, and the patient again becomes hypoxic. Then he becomes more anxious, and he becomes more restless, but he's oriented. Then they go on to a point when, uh, you know, they become disoriented, and they can become agitated and disoriented. So there are two points where we as a healthcare professional can intervene, and our algorithm is uh, uh, dividing the agitation and delivery into two points. First one is, but the patient has got worsened dyspnea, hypoxia, restless and anxious, but they're still oriented. And that's one point where we can intervene. And the second one is patient is disoriented and they are restless, anxious, as well, agitated and disoriented. So how do, you, how do we evaluate the patient? And there are lots of tools available to evaluate a patient uh, to assess for delirium, lots of tools available. We have suggested a simple tool uh, in our ebook, and I'm going to explain about that tool, how to use that. Again, it might not be appropriate in our scenario. Always do it if it's appropriate for your patient. But this is the simplest tool that you can use uh, to assess a patient um, you know, in, in, with, uh, quickly for delirium in our scenario. And it's called the 480 tool to assess delirium. It's called four A's. First one is alertness. Second is AMT4. Third is attention. And fourth is the acute change of fluctuating pose. So alertness, it's scored from zero to four, where the two, if the patient is normal, fully alert, obviously they score zero. If there's mild sleepiness for less than 10 seconds and they wake, wake up and they're normal, then again they score zero. But if the alertness is clearly abnormal, then they score four in that. The second one is AMT4, which is abbreviated mental test score. 
Now, to do an abbreviated mental test score, the questions that we normally ask is age of the patient, date of birth, name of the hospital or building, and current year, which year are we? This is a core question, a simple question, which we normally could ask any confused person and get answer for that. If they answer without any mistake, they score zero. If there's one mistake, they score one. If they have two or more mistake or they're untestable, they score two. Third one is attention, where you ask the patient to list the months of the year backwards. So you start from uh, December, November, like that backwards. And if you're able to do it seven months or more correctly, uh, you score zero. But they start, uh, but they score less than seven. They're not able to do seven months or they refuse to start, then they uh, get a score of one. And again, they're un untestable. They are drowsy or they're not even able to start the months, they score two. And the, and the fourth one is the acute change of fluctuating goals. So the important thing to know is, so delirium is a, uh, is a is a an acute acute picture, and it's not like dementia where there's uh, cognitive impairment for a long time. So there's an acute change and there's a fluctuating change. So the the, the fourth important fourth point is actually very very important, but we might not be able to elicit in our patient because we need a collateral history for that. We have to ask the family uh, about the when did it start. So it's an evidence of acute change or significant change of fluctuation alertness or cognition or other mental function the last two weeks. I'm still evident in the last 24 hours. So that's how we diagnose it. Now at this point, probably is not able to test for that or you will have to call the family at home by telephone and ask for it. Again, if there is an acute change of fluctuating course in the last two weeks, they score four. And if no, there's no score. And this is, uh, this is a, a 480 score and that's how you can score delirium and assess delirium. Again, um, it might not be possible in our scenario, but this is the simplest tool that is available. Now, uh, all, all the guidelines that, again, the guidelines that we've used for our ebook is from NICE guidelines, as well as there's a center to advance palliative care guidelines. And all the guidelines, even though it's a COVID-19 scenario, have suggested that we have to look for other reversible causes. So when we learn about delirium, we, we should think about other reversible causes of delirium. One of them is pain. You had a session to manage pain yesterday. So these patients can have myalgia and other, other sort of pain, or they might or they probably could have other diagnoses like cancer and are always in pain. Are we managing that efficiently? And these are the reason they become delirious. So check for that. The other one is breathlessness, which we had just covered. And then are the simple things like immunoretention, retention, constipation, which sometimes we might forget to look for. And especially in elderly patients, it's it's, it might be worthwhile to check for that. So have they in retention, uh, have, are they constipated? And then the other one is um, uh, the withdrawal syndrome. Uh, this was more relevant towards initial stages of lockdown when all the uh, beverages were shut and we did have uh, lots, of, uh, lots of people coming with withdrawal syndrome. And again, that can happen to uh, COVID patients also, or they could be withdrawing from alcohol or they could withdraw from, they, they might be taking narcotics for a long time, uh, like morphine and tramadol, which the patient are taking regularly. So, uh, you know, are they withdrawing from that? Typical patient with anxiety, agitation and delirium, we have to make sure all these are clear or they have no other correctable causes or other causes of delirium before we say label that it's COVID-19 symptom complex of breathlessness and delirium. Management, um, again, non-pharmacological management, um, you know, try and <clears throat> the healthcare professionals should, should be calm, especially dealing with the delirium scenario. They should be compassionate, try and, uh, you know, try, and, try to be calm and compassionate and capable to manage. Uh, always uh, give an optimal response to the patient. You should be responsive to the needs of the patient. Um, try and have a gentle conversation. Uh, patient would be anxious. You probably would be anxious because you will be dealing with lots of COVID patients and you know what's happening. So, but try and be calm and have a gentle conversation and try and reassure the patient. They would be worried about their family, about the uh, things happening at home or the future. Try and keep the room air and lighted as much as possible. Um, and again, they would be worried about the family. So try and, you know, if they want to convey a message to family, again, encourage video calling. They are not able to see the family. The family is not able to see, see them. So if possible, if we can do a video call for, for the patient to the family, encourage them to ask any questions they, they might have. So, you know, or try and allay the anxiety in an, uh, and manage them in a non-pharmacological way. Again, the pharmacological management described in the ebook as algorithm, uh, we have divided that into mild uh, and severe and, and again as i mentioned in the first slide agitated and oriented patients with anxiety and panic but the patient is oriented the management is different if the patient is disoriented the management is different so the first one is the agitated 
and oriented patient having anxiety, panic, and fear. If they're mild and the patient is able to solo, so the patient is oriented, then the first plan that we suggest is benzodiazepine. So you go for lorazepam, uh, 0.5 milligram to 1 milligram um, BD orally or sublingually. The same oral tablet can be given a sublingual. Or you can use clonazepam, 0.25 to 0.5 milligram BD. If the patient is not able to solo, we can go for midazolam and you can give us 2.5 to 5 mg as bolus injection as and when needed. Now, if the, if the symptoms persist and they become moderate, so it worsens, so with bolus dose is not settling, moderate delirium, moderate uh, symptoms, you go for agitation persists, start a continuous infusion, either IV or subcut infusion, with 10 milligram midazolam on 24 hours. Still, the patient is still oriented, so the moderate symptoms for oriented patient, you start with benzodiazepine, but the symptoms are still persisting after starting infusion, then you can add an add, add in addition haloperidol, 0.5 milligram every 15 minutes as needed, or 1.5 to 5 milligram in 24 hours. So can, that can be added to the midazolam infusion. Now, agitated and disoriented patients. So patients agitated, the last, uh, in a, the last scenario when the patient becomes uh, disoriented, which is called delirium, we start with haloperidol instead of the benzodiazepine. We give a haloperidol first line. So we give one milligram, slow IV or subcut or 1.5 milligram per orally. And this dose can be repeated every hour up to dose of five milligram. Or we can give a bolus injection of one milligram haloperidol, given either IV or subcut. And then you start a continuous infusion of five milligram haloperidol can be started simultaneously. That is only possible if you've got the uh, the facility of giving us a continuous infusion, then you can start the continuous infusion with the uh, 5 milligram haloperidol over uh, at the same time. Um, then again, this is the, described in the algorithm. Okay. Uh, so coming to moderate delirium, so if agitation persists, then you can give add an insulin metaslam. So we start with haloperidol, and then you come to moderate delirium, agitation is persisting, you can add an insulin metaslam, 1 mg, slow IV or subcut, and repeat every 10 minutes till the patient becomes settled. Or you can give it bolus addition of 2 mg metaslam, IV or subcut, and then you start the continuous infusion of metaslam, 10 mg, along with haloperidol. So the idea is to settle the patient, which can be done. The ideal scenario is studying continuous infusion if the facility is available. You give a bolus dose that will settle the patient immediately. But because it's short acting, the patient is going to become unsettled soon. To avoid that, you put that in an injection. So you start that, you can combine them together, midazolam and haloperidol. In fact, you can combine the three drugs together. If there's agitation, uh, you know, breathlessness agitation complex, you can combine morphine, midazolam and haloperidol together in a single syringe infusion pump and give it together over 24 hours. So we're combining them together, bolus of 2 mg midazolam, IV subcut, and a continuous infusion of midazolam 10 mg can be started along with injection haloperidol. Then uh, coming to the intractable agitation delirium, where symptoms persist uh, in the end stage, a maximum dose of uh, haloperidol 20 milligram and initial midazolam 30 milligram can be given as a continuous infusion, either intravenous or subcutaneous in 24 hours. Uh, and as I mentioned, you can give them either two drugs together or three drugs together if you're managing the whole symptom complex of breathlessness and agitation. This is the algorithm that I mentioned is in page 19 of the ebook, uh, and all the doses that I've described is given in the algorithm. So to summarize, um, we need to recognize the symptom complex of breathlessness and agitation of the severe COVID-19 pneumonia. 480 delirium assessment tool is quick tool to use to assess for delirium. And remember to assess, rule out, and manage other causes of delirium. And um, for anxiety and restlessness without disorientation, start a benzodiazepine. For restlessness, agitation with disorientation, start an antipsychotic, first line. These, uh, there are further resources and training. Uh, these are given in the ebook at the end. Where if, you, if you want to read more about COVID-19, as well as about palliative care, it's given there. And also, um, you know, <clears throat> there's a feedback form, which I think the ECHO will be sharing it. And if you could fill that in about the session. Um, before I uh, end, I would like to sh um, 
show you um, one more. As I mentioned, the ebook e is in the next, second stage of your revising it. So we'll be adding something called a list of essential medications for palliative care. Uh, now uh, this will be added to the next version of ebook. So this is in the process, and all the medications so um, in the ebook are in bold. So as I mentioned, the important medication that is needed for the managing the symptom complex of breathlessness and agitation would be the morphine, uh, midazolam, so benzodiazepine, uh, lorazepam, and haloperidol. So we're giving this list also uh, just for reference so that you, know, you can use it. And it's, it's important that we make sure all these medications are available when we manage the patients with COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sunita. Mm -hmm. The session is open for discussion now. If you have any comments or questions, please raise your hands or unmute yourself and speak. <clears throat> there was one question in the uh, in the chat. Uh, somebody has asked for the total doses ten milligram of twenty four hours. Yeah, that's a starting dose of morphine, uh, 10 milligrams 24 hours. Again, I, you can still give bolus. The one thing to remember is, even if you start an infusion of any medication, you can still give boluses in between, or you should still give bolus in between, depending on the patient's symptoms. So some patients might settle with just a 10 milligram, some patients might not, and we don't know how bad the symptom is going to be. So always uh, write up the uh, SOS doses or the PRN doses as needed. And you, you, what, we, what we normally do is we tell the nursing staff to give adequate SOS doses needed. And if you get the time, you can actually increase the dose of the syringe driver. But sometimes that may not, we don't have enough time to do that. So you start with 10 milligram and then you know, increase accordingly. Anybody has any questions or comments? Just to uh, just to just, just for us to know whether uh, how many of you are actually familiar with using opioids and Moira has mentioned a comment saying that access to opioids may be a challenge. So in, in your clinical practice, wherever you're working, you can if you can't speak, just put in the chat box. Uh, is are you using opioids frequently for anything and how easy is it to get uh, opioids like morphine in your clinical practice? <clears throat> so while I wait for you uh -huh. to write the uh, chat, Biju has uh, asked a suggestion whether we should reduce the morphine dose if patient has delirium. Now, I think uh, what I would normally do uh, in, in, in my clinical practice is if the patient already has delirium and then it's not due to morphine, then probably I wouldn't reduce the morphine dose. If I've started the morphine and the patient develops delirium, then, you know, and the patient has got renal failure, then that could be a reason morphine is contributing to it. Then I probably might reduce the morphine dose. But I, I can, I, you know, it's open to other palliative care physicians for their, for their comments. Um, Dr. Rajani has given, given an opinion that she is accustomed to using opioids of breathlessness in ward and ICU settings. Anybody else? Dr. Shutra has mentioned that these algorithms will be useful for intensive care routinely for known COVID when symptoms are refractory. So I think, I think that's very, very useful thing. Uh, maybe a good thing that has come out of this whole COVID thing is we have developed this algorithm which can be re, re, you know, replaced or, or can be reproduced and used in other settings also, not just COVID-19. This is what we normally do in palliative care uh, for end-state diseases. But everybody, uh, all the patients, at least in India, everybody are not aware of that. So one of the reasons, you know, this probably this uh, e-module e and uh, e-learning will help us to, if you can use these algorithms in your settings for known COVID situations, for end of life, for uh, blood pressure patients, COPD, end stage heart failure, you know, uh, end stage cancer patients who are dying uh, with such difficult symptoms, this can be used for them also. Um, Moira, are people, are people uh, used to subcut route? Any questions about that from the group? So that's the other, other thing that you could uh, comment in the chat. Subcutaneous route is, uh, you know, palliative is very familiar with that. 
but I'm sure non palliative care nursing staff are not familiar. Non palliative care nursing staffs are not familiar with Sapkar Dut, which is very, very simple, uh, you know, simple to do. So, are you all familiar with the Sapkar Dut? You can, you can comment on the chat because the, the reason we go for that is it's non traumatic, it can be taught to the family. You can, we, we can even teach them at, to do it at home. So you can teach the family, to, you can decide. today I discharged a patient from general hospital uh, by teaching the family to put a subcut uh, line in and you know, discharging with injections. And so the patient can spend the last days at home. So that's what sub, we always prefer subcut route. So again, if you've got, if you're not familiar with that, uh, please feel free to ask. Dr. Tedeschi has a question. Who's asked a question? Dr. Tedeschi. Hello, uh, hi. I wanted to ask. Hello. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask a question regarding the uh, breathing exercises which had been told. So, uh, how to teach them those breathing exercises? Because the patients are COVID positive and we are telling them to, uh, like, obviously, we are in masks and even they are in masks. But then how to teach them? So uh, telemedicine, using telemedicine? Yeah. Yeah. So that is just like any, Please, any, can other, you any other, any, any other uh, communication uh, difficulty in COVID-19. So, uh, you know, if, if you are, um, if you are seeing the patient, I mean, if, if the physiotherapists are getting involved with the patient face to face, obviously by maintaining the distance, if they're able to do it, like that, that's better. Or if you can use telemedicine facility, you can tease the patients to that. But in, in the COVID-19 scenario, we might not get the time to do that. That is the other problem. Patient could, uh, you know, deteriorate pretty quickly. But teaching them, uh, there are practical difficulties as well as whether they are well into the breathing exercise. That is also a uh, difficulty is there. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Uh, there is another question. Do you have suggestion about using brown water? Thank you, ma'am. Inhalation for bronchus spasm of COVID-19 patients and respiratory transmission. I think what we have uh, written from all the uh, articles as published is uh, read about that is basically nebulizations have, have been contraindicated, but we can still use inhalers. So that's my understanding. And so whatever they're continuing before, you can use that. We did have a discussion about this um, regarding mucolytics and uh, you know. In, but I think we 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 haven't like NSL cysteine and all mucolytic as nebulizers, but none of the physicians who are managing COVID-19 are using that right now. That's the understanding I got. But uh, anybody else, Moira or anybody else want to, or Sunil, you want to comment on that? No, I also understand that uh, uh, what you have told is uh, the right thing that I have uh, read, uh, that uh, uh, aerosol generating procedures like uh, uh, nebulization uh, is not commonly used, but uh, uh, dilator inhalation is uh, or meter dose inhalers can be used. That would be better in case of COVID-19. Yeah, I would just come in and, and agree with that. I, I, I think we should really be very careful to avoid fans and nebulizers because then we're aerosoling droplets. But I think more simple measures, for, particularly from people with mild and moderate symptoms, then that's when our breathing exercises and um, these other measures may have a place. I think we're mostly using bronchodilators and people who already have the need for bronchodilators rather than introducing them new for COVID. Um, and then Sunita, I think, is very nicely described for this severe progressive uh, respiratory distress, how we need to intervene more quickly and using the subcutaneous route. Yeah. I think there was a question about post-COVID uh, respiratory function. I don't know whether you want to comment on that, Sunita. Somebody asked if we were going to need to use opioids and the like when people are discharged. Are you happy to comment on that? You like me to? Uh, yeah, you would like to say that. I didn't see that. I think it's really interesting. I think there's increasingly now. I I I was listening yesterday to UK colleagues who are doing a trial on patients post COVID because I think those who've had a severe viral pneumonia run the risk of having ongoing respiratory problems. So I suspect we wouldn't be predominantly using opiates in that circumstance, but I think we might be looking at pulmonary rehabilitation. Our physiotherapists will have a big role in that, but also then we're going to be having to maximise lung function, and that's when I think our bronchodilator use, maybe even anticholinergic will have a role. So I think there's going to be a big post-COVID um, load for us to also care for in terms of respiratory function. Thank you. 
It's, uh, that was Dr. Rechini's uh, comment, actually. Um, chronic uh, reckless endothelia, recovering patient with severe COVID, you would likely prepare. Again, probably that depends on uh, how much uh, residual breathlessness they have got, isn't it? How much residual lung damage they have got, but they did the studies on that. Are they, is it going to be reversible damage or reversible damage or not? So that's quite in, yeah, an interesting one. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Rajini has also mentioned, uh, Dr. Rajini um, is a pulmonologist and she's got a special interest in palliative care. Uh, I think I'll ask her to talk about it, but I'll just read what she has written and then probably ask her to talk. Nebulization may be used only for patients who are unable to use MDA and spacer. If used, the staff must be in full co complement of PPE. Innovative solutions like using clear plastic drape tents around the head end of the bed can decrease the risk to staff if nebulization is used. A loosely tied triple um, so plastic surgical mask uh, can be used to over the patients to face a limit spread. So Dr. Rajini, would you like to uh, comment more about, you know, have you had an experience of treating COVID patients or anything on this topic? Um, hi, um, I haven't had personal experience in um, uh, treating COVID patients, but this has been the recommendation of the Indian Chess Society. We have regular updates and webinars and, uh, you know, also with the American College of Chess Physicians, uh, um, combined, uh, 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 you know, conferences and webinars with the British Thoracic Society and multiple national groups. So we all agree that nebulization is only for those patients who are unable to use an MDI and spacer. And yes, we will have a few patients who are unable to use it. In that case, then we want the staff to be in full PPE. And people have designed very innovative um, boxes and drapes like they have designed for intubation or bronchoscopy, a very loosely made up plastic tent like thing um, can be used. Um, so even for example, when we've used non-invasive ventilation, the helmet kind of NIV, which unfortunately we don't have enough of in India, but the helmet NIV decreases the risk of aerosol to stuff. So uh, that's one of the options. And I think uh, that's, that's one way of getting around it because you can't Complete, you, you have to give the patient bronchodilator if they are having bronchospasm um, and just do it safely. So having two layers of masks, as in the, the staff is in PPE with an N95 and the patient has uh, a triple ply surgical mask on them, that reduces the risk of spread. Innovative developments in India, Dr. Chitra asked, uh, that's, that's actually the plastic tent um, I've, I've seen that used by my colleagues in Gujarat and in uh, Calcutta. So uh, you kind of rig up uh, plastic drapes, clear plastic drapes, so that the patient can see you. You can rig up the nebulizer machine and everything on the patient's side of it. And it, uh, you know, uh, you can just like how you would set up OT drapes using uh, IV poles, you do that with plastic sheeting. Thanks, Dr. Rajini. That's quite useful. If Dr. Rajini could also comment on whether the Indian um, Chess Society are looking at post-COVID chest issues, have that come up at all? Well, the Indian Chess Society has not, we've not really had enough of cases to uh, start studying that. But I know that in China and in Italy, there are some patients who've had long-term um, uh, fibrosis issues. So I know that there are a couple of pilot studies starting on the use of perfenidone in patients who... Um, who have required long-term ventilation or uh, you know, uh, the repeat CT scans after three to four weeks are still showing some amount of changes in the basis of the lungs. So there are a couple of pilot studies going on on perfenidone in these patients. Thank you. <clears throat> Any more comments or questions? Anybody? Um, I have a question regarding the, the delirium um, in these patients. Um, we've also seen a lot of, uh, I don't know if there is any work done on this as yet, but um, it seems like some of the patients exhibit some kind of disinhibitory behavior. Um, 
that was one of the thoughts that is that part of the disease process as well like the initial confusion or uh, um, agitated angry occasionally violent whether that's not really just anxiety but really behavior that's out of character so it seems more like a disinhibition um, anything on that Maria, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, very, very interesting. I, I, I hadn't seen that specifically just about disinhibition, but what we had uh, when we look particularly at the psychosocial uh, management algorithm, we were looking at the evidence there and there's certainly organic delirium, no question. So whether that's driven by hypoxia, which is obviously such a strong uh, factor, whether it's driven, driven by fever and the, the other complex causes of confusion. Um, I'm not sure that I've seen anything that says there's a separate um, disinhibition, but if you put together the organic delirium, the hypoxia, the extreme fear and worry, the isolation, the anxiety, um, I think that is a very potent mix for delirium for sure. And, and use of steroids and yeah. medications and some things that might make it worse. Dr. Chitra, would you like to add something on, on that? Um, actually, the psychiatrist. Can you hear about. me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, like Moira said, I think it can be taken as part of a delirium only. I mean, just disinhibition doesn't uh, categorize into a, any specific kind of uh, disorder as such, but it could be taken as part of agitation. Uh, but disinhibition, usually, it's more organic in nature. So, I would attribute it more to delirium because it is due to some changes in the brain uh, that brings up, especially the frontal lobes. So I would see it as more as delirium. I manage it just like you manage any hyperactive delirium. Thanks. Thank you. I'm in a vehicle, so I, I'm not sure whether I'm clear. Oh, yeah, you are clear. Audible. Dr. Javadjavagis, do you have a question? Uh, doctor, you can speak. Dr. Javadjavagis? Yes. So you had a question? No, no questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I don't see any more questions. Shall we? Uh, yeah, there is one uh, if patient had a silent hypoxia when we used uh, opioid or benzodiazepine. Uh, I mean, I think the clinical scenario is that patients do look well. Of the, what I've heard is, uh, and but they are very hypoxic, and then they deteriorate pretty quickly. So the is a question uh, is is the patient having a sudden hypoxia because of opioid, or is it the clinical scenario? What was the question? Doctor Rodi. You know, I would just add to that what we're looking to hear. I mean, I don't think we would. Um, be treating, we'd be treating the symptom of dyspnea with our, our opiates, not not the, and the underlying condition we'd be treating separately. So part of the assessment would be the level of hypoxia for sure. Um, and not, not everybody's going to need an opiate or benzodiazepine unless they've got symptomatic breathlessness. But we would still be acting on the hypoxia for sure. So we will be giving hypooxygen and uh, According to the according to the clinical scenario, on the goals of care and which patient should go. So an IV everything it all depends on the patient's um, discussion, goals of care discussion. We should have a, have an interesting session probably on Thursday. Starting that. Autogeny acid sarin hypoxis asymptomatic by description. Any more questions?
Uh, so uh, we can wind up this session. I don't see any more questions. So thank you, uh, Dr. Sonida, for your wonderful session. And uh, thank you, uh, all others who have contributed uh, for this session. Um, thank you all. Before you leave, please uh, do this feedback uh, session, uh, questions. Okay, so I think we can leave. We will see you tomorrow. Thank you all. Uh, tomorrow we will have a session on uh, communication. communication by Dr. Biju Raghun. We'll see you then. Thank you.